Xin chào tại gia Yuki Dukode. I am very happy to be here. I also bring uh, greetings from the Philippine College of Chess Physicians, of which I am the past president today, BNRS, for this wonderful conference. Um, I was asked to speak on a very difficult topic, which is TB elimination in our lifetime. Actually, what can be done with this skin? This is the outline of my talk. And uh, I feel uncomfortable because Vietnam is actually uh, doing a lot of good work in TB ahead of my own country in terms of the different indicators. But there are many similarities and challenges between our countries and I'd like to share my own thoughts about it. My perspective is really from a research perspective and someone has worked with WHO and uh, different partners across the world. This is the end TV strategy for 2016 to 2020. And this has since been updated. But I would like to share with the audience some of the best practices. Uh, an example, maybe three countries which are quite different, but maybe which we can learn from uh, in our countries and here in the Western Pacific region because the highest TV burden is in this part of the world. And in particular, this document and this handbook, while still a little old a few years ago, but will be practical in the sharing of the three country experience which we should learn from and how they are trying to control us and well eliminate tuberculosis. This is the vision of a world free of tuberculosis where we would have no deaths and disease and suffering and the global goal is to end the global TB epidemic. There are milestones and targets and there, these are the different years that are targeted. 2020, 25, 2030, which is also the Sustainable Development Goal target and the NTB target. The target across the world is to reduce the number of deaths compared to a baseline of 2015 by 35%, rising to 75%, then 90 and 95% by 2035 and to reduce the incidence of the TB rate compared to 20, uh, 2015 by 20, 50, 80, 90 percent and to reduce to zero the number of families facing a catastrophic cost due to TB which I will go to in the next slide. And this again is the expression of those goals and the catastrophic cost is universally defined as spending out of pocket of more than 20% of a household's <laughs> income. If you lose income of about 20%, then it is a catastrophic uh, cost. These are the three pillars of the Stop TB Elimination Plan. One is called the Integrated Patient-Centered Care and Prevention. The second one is bold policies and supportive systems. And the third one is intensified research and innovation. So pillar one is really bringing the diagnosis closer to the patient and using various strategies, targeting drug susceptible as well as drug resistant cases. As part of the patient-centered care, and depending on the needs, all patients should receive both education, emotional, and economic support. And those contacts of TB living with HIV, all persons would need to be assessed for both nutritional status, because apparently it's also a very important component, as well as the presence of comorbid disease. Important is the last bullet, which is now increasingly important across the world trying to provide digital health tools that I will go back to you, that needs to be introduced to improve the compliance of patients so they can take their medicine, which is the biggest challenge in both drug-sensitive and multi-drug resistant TB. And in Pillar 2, the active coordination across government ministries, I think there is a very important uh, law that was enacted in uh, Vietnam that actually unifies 
all the efforts so because to stop TB it's not just the work of your ministry of health or even the doctors that's to involve all sectors of society which is also the same in the Philippines we may have a very good national TV program, but if we do not involve the ministries of defense, education, and others, then you will be missing many of the other patients that are present in the prisons and in the other communities, like in, in the, similar to the Philippines, the farmers, the poor, uh, and other workers. And uh, of course, uh, what I'm interested in, intensified research and innovation. This is actually the ERS plan to eliminate TB. In many countries of uh, Europe, they are actually into this plan already, which is to try to reduce the, uh, the current cases they have, which is less than 100 cases per million, to the definition of elimination, which is, sorry, can I give up? Which is to make it one per one million. Uh, no one has actually achieved the one over one million and in fact part of the goal is to reduce latent TB prevalence by 1% and also to reduce these cases. And in the ERS as well as in the global strategy there are eight components and each of these components actually are very important. Now, one example of a country that is almost there is the Netherlands. And this data is actually almost a decade old. But in this document shared, in the Netherlands, they have a history of, in the 1950s and 60s, doing mass x-ray screening of their population. That was their first step. Then in the 1980s, they became very aggressive in treating the active cases and looking at the contact tracing of patients who are living or are in close contact with the TB patients. And in the more recent time, they have been going into molecular epidemiology, doing DNA fingerprinting and understanding how the, the disease is transmitted in their populations, as well as a very aggressive screening of migrants in their country. We can all learn from this because, for example, in the screening of the active TB children, uh, active TB cases, they actually had a very aggressive uh, targeting of these groups like homeless people, IV drug addicts, prisoners, and uh, newly arrived immigrants and asylum seekers. So they really went out of their way to target this. And these are the specific uh, tactics in terms of screening, Outbreak management, again, using DNA fingerprinting to look for who was the index case, who was the source of the infection, since it's not very uh, prevalent and it's not very common, and there are very stringent infection control. Another interesting country that we can all learn from is Cuba. It has one of the lowest mortality rates of any uh, country in the world because of their aggressive uh, community doctors who actually are doing uh, rounds of patients uh, assigned to them. And one of the secrets is because the ratio is very good. They have one doctor for every 120 families. That is how, how, how widespread they are. But I think one of the secrets is this number three, which is also now taken into publicity by WHO and the Stop TV movement a social security that provides 100% payment. If you develop TB in uh, Cuba, you will uh, go on a vacation from your work, but you will continue to be paid and will be given nutritional support until you get well. So unlike many other countries, sometimes you lose a job. In Vietnam, uh, in, Vietnam in Cuba, once you get diagnosed to have TB, you will be treated first and then you will be supported. So this is, I think, one of the important components of this country. The third one is actually Slovakia, where they also did the implementation of the dots in the 90s and did aggressive contact tracing. One of the unique things that has been done by them is that the MDR treatment is done by pulmonary specialists in that country, which is a little unique. In, um, in many countries, this is not done. But since this is the VNRS, I will return to it what we think uh, should be our role as pulmonologists. 
Unfortunately, the Philippines and Vietnam share this distinction of there is no longer a one list of high burden TB countries. There is now a list for drug sensitive, one for MDR, and one for TB and HIV. Uh, both Philippines and Vietnam are in the list of TB and MDR TB. Both of us have very low HIV. And in fact, uh, the Philippines, because of the recent survey, is now number four in the drug sensitive and number six in the MDR, where Vietnam has gone out of the top ten because of the great efforts of the TB program in this country. And I think one of the big things is because of the stop TB movement here. Uh, Vietnam brought in all the government forces. Vietnam, in fact, has had substantial progress in reaching the TB-related Millennium Development Goals. You have mortality ahead of the schedule from 52 uh, for 100,000 in 1990s to 19 more than half by 2013. Unfortunately, you still have MDR, which numbers in the 5,000. And uh, from what I've read in the uh, literature, one person dies of TB in Vietnam every hour. So you still have 12,000 deaths from TB and you still have 130,000 cases of uh, drug sensitive TB. It is still a major problem. So uh, WHO is pursue, pursuing uh, great support for the national program and is, uh, all efforts in Vietnam is to go to the vulnerable populations such as those with TB and HIV. Vietnam was the first country in the Western Pacific to actually do a survey on catastrophic costs. The bad news is, uh, among those with MDR, 98% suffer from catastrophic uh, costs and uh, two-thirds from the drug sensitive. Compare this to the Philippines where a recent survey was also done where MDR patients suffered two-thirds or 66% of the catastrophic costs and 33, 35% for those uh, with, with uh, drug sensitive. Let me now share the TB plan to eliminate TB, which is called the field step, which was pro presented by our national TB program manager last year in our field cap convention. I share this because there are similarities to what is happening here in this region and in Vietnam. The reasons for developing the plan is it is still a major problem. Uh, we are uh, trying to align with the NTB strategy. We actually have a new TB law, which is similar to a new law that that Vietnam has also enacted to reinforce the national strategy for TB. And these are some of the gaps that were identified in the programmatic review, including looking for the missing cases. Where are they? Inadequate implementation of services for LTBI, which I think Dr. Fox will be talking about later. Limited reach in the poor, lack of human resources, weak systems in the supply chain, surveillance, and data generation. In order to answer that, the national program the Philippines has come up with an acronym called REACH TB, Reaching TB, with this symbol. Replace the entire area of Bismia with expert, engaging our private providers which provide 30% of those seeking care, accessible patient-centered facilities, community health seeking behavior, high risk, and in uh, intensive supervision and networking, and funding. I will breeze through this because I have another talk after Dr. Fox and I will concentrate on that. This one, in, this is a project we have done with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine with uh, Dr. Bertie Squire and Ivor Landy on mathematical modeling to actually find a way how to deploy the new tools in TV. So I will skip a few of this and reserve this for a later talk because I want to concentrate on it. Just as a preview, this is a part of the model that we have. And I'm not sure if that will move. It actually supposedly moves. So we have developed a pathway where every step of a patient's entry from the health center to the time he is either diagnosed or is lost, we have actually created a patient pathway. And uh, this took us more than a year of 30 variations to perfect this to put into the model because the math model will not work if the pathway is not good. This one is a sharing of some of the projects in my own university. One is called the TB Fit, which is the one with the Liverpool School. One is truncate with the National University of Singapore, which seeks to shorten the treatment of drug-sensitive TB to two months. 
the phoenix uh, seeks to treat LPDI with delaminate and uses a magic box to measure compliance that is GPS uh, compliant. We also have recently gotten the award for VDOC, which is a app so you can see patients swallowing the medicine to see that they're taking them. They don't have to go to the center or to the doctor's clinic. They just have to submit the, 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 the captured video with a time on it. And the Coach TV, which is trying to bring the treatment of MDR at the community level with trained workers. This is uh, the algorithm that our government is proposing to replace the old algorithm of patients. What is new here is that instead of what we usually do, is just we wait for patients to come to us in what we call passive case finding. We are now aggressively going to look for these patients in so-called aggregate communities or congregate, example of which are the prisons or in, in our place, or old folks' homes, retirement homes, uh, cancer institutes where there's a lot of immunotherapy going on. So you look actively for those patients where they are missing. Dialysis patients, transplant patients, diabetes centers. I saw a lot of these different centers in the right now. And active case finding. Reassessing the use of the x-ray, which for many years the pulmonologists have actually been clamoring. So instead of just mentioning the high-risk groups, we now know that we have to target all these uh, patients, diabetic patients and uh, similar cancer patients, connective tissue, silicosis, the elderly. I will have this in the later. So. And since uh, my next up is this one, replacing the AFB smear. I know it is not yet fully implemented in Vietnam, in the Philippines, about one-third of all patients are going through rapid diagnostic tests. In many parts of the, the world, this is not yet happening. In fact, uh, it's like this is not yet uh, And once you are uh, positive with the gene expert, then you go through this algorithm. If you are not, then you go through the drug-sensitive test. But there is a avenue, which I will return to in my last slide, in which you still have clinically diagnosed TB. In the Philippines, we have a lot of that. Bacteriologically negative, smear negative, expert negative, culture negative. But many of them are still enrolled as active TB. In our study with the, with the Liverpool, 50% of these clinical diagnoses are not active TB. So I'm pretty sure it's probably also true in many places around the world. I will just go back to this. So, one important thing is the reassessment and the re use of chest x-ray for screening. So it is now used as a first line for triaging and screening patients. Remember the story of the Netherlands where in the 50s and 60s they did it. And with the digital x-ray, they should be better. Of course, there are uh, limitations. X-ray is not widely available and the quality of the x-ray is a major issue. So, I uh, think in Vietnam it's now also widely available, so you can actually use it. And of course, the bad news is there is really no pathognomonic sign of, we know as pulmo that once we see a cavity or apical lesions, this is probably TB. But it, research after research doesn't bear that out, that it does not relate with the burden of disease, and um, even this recent study, that uses the MDR moxie in a sub-analysis. They correlated cavities with the burden of TB. It still did not correlate. So it looks like the evidence is poor on this. So it's very good because it's very, very sensitive. Even in our national survey, it was up to 98 sensitive. But to make it the final use of the diagnosis of TB, it is still not correct. Anyway, uh, there are other things that are, these are my not last slides. One of the things that are being launched is to try to simplify the treatment of TB. I became very involved with the Global Alliance and I'm very happy that there are these three new drugs, the laminine, the daquiline, and a new one called protona, protonamide, which used to be PA824. So they are now going to attempt the, this regimen to treat drug-sensitive TB and it will only be two months. And for MDR TB, six months. So that is something that we hope will be important in the armamentarium for TB. 
there are other things done in uh, my university. We actually partnered with Mensana to do a breath test. Not all patients can produce a sputum. Okay, so there's a lot of patients with no symptoms. In our national survey, up to 20%. Uh, I think in a survey in Cambodia and Vietnam, also almost at that number. But everyone can give a breath. Uh, so there's a study that was actually trying to collect a breath and analyze the volatile gases and see its sensitivity is around 60 to 70 and the specificity of around the same number still could be improved but uh, I think it is uh, actually in the WHO list. And it was actually published by a colleague of mine, Dr. Dalai and uh, Michael Phillips. And I think uh, this has not been pursued too much but it's actually now being used for cancer. The other thing that has fascinated us as in the hardest to reach places, there is a pilot study now done in Papua New Guinea, but originally in uh, in Madagascar, which is a, a popular cartoon in Madagascar. And anyway, there's a community at the top of the mountain, so no one can reach them, no doctor, no nurse. So they use a drone to bring the medicine, bring a sputum, and then try to bring the test. So my university is trying to partner with this group from Stony Brook to see if we can pilot it. Uh, I, I like Vietnam where you have a long, long uh, one country. Philippines has 7,200 islands. Uh, uh, in Indonesia has even more. So imagine there are island communities that no one can reach. So we think that might be something that could be promising, but we have to show its cost effectiveness. In fact, we're very serious about combining those technologies with the Omni, which we have been awaiting for a long time, where you can have health worker bringing the Omni from community to community. In, uh, in the case of Vietnam, I think, uh, and committees and uh, the slope models, and then you can test patients using the, the coffee-like kit. And we are also trying to revolutionize the X-ray by inventing. The Japanese had a experience with the Haiyan Yolanda uh, disaster in the Philippines, the strongest typhoon in the world. And they actually used a digital X-ray without electricity. So now we are experimenting with some of the work to develop a handheld X-ray that you can bring to the different communities. And this was piloted by the Japanese. I would end with this slide, which was invented by Dr. Bertie Squire. At the moment, even with our fanciest techniques and most accurate diagnostics, we are only picking this blue group. Okay, and sometimes misdiagnosing the white group, the one I said, clinical diagnosis, negative sputum, uh, 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 negative expert, and usually they're not TB. So. People being tested, we are missing this. Even with the gene expert fully deployed 100% in our countries, we will still miss patients. These are the ones with TB, the blue. The ones we are picking up are only this. And the green one here, we are not yet still able to pick. There is still a group that is missing. If we are to eliminate TB, we must find that green group. And even with the expert, we won't be able to find it. We have to look for them, whether it's active case finding, it's uh, contact tracing, it is something that is going to be a challenge. So the question asked of me was, can we eliminate TB? And what can we do? Maybe I am 61 years old, I will not see TB eliminated in my lifetime. But the young ones here, I still believe that maybe within uh, half a half a century or 30 years, we will eliminate because there's still so many L8 and TB and that's a good intro to Dr. Fox next talk. Thank you very much.